Good and good morning.、Um, today I'll be talking to you about deep brain stimulation for dystonia, and this is the outline. So to begin, we'll talk a little bit about dystonia.、Um, Dr. Oppenheim in 1911 had defined this term, dystonia musculorum deformans. Uh, uh, to describe a multifaceted movement disorder with pronounced tonic cramping states in the neck, head, and proximal extremities, these involuntary movements are caused by concurrent contractions of both agonist and antagonist muscles, and are often exacerbated during action, but can improve with relaxation, slip, sleep, or sensory tricks. Historically, there have been two classifications for dystonia. The clinical and the etiological. The clinical classification focuses on the time of onset versus a child versus adult, or anatomical. And today we'll focus on a focal blepharospasm,、um, which is located in the face, obviously, and also Mage syndrome, which is a segmental dystonia. And that has the symptoms of blepharospasm as well as oromandibular symptoms. The etiological classification、um, depends on if it's primary, there's no known cause, and it could present early in life, and secondary, where there is a known cause. So, in the past, surgical treatment for dystonia has involved three separate、um, types. Electrical stimulation or lesioning of different areas in the brain, and on the right you'll see a picture of the cord、uh, of the brain, and there are different pathways that are involved with movement,、um, and then this is known as the cortical thalamo basal ganglia cortical、uh, pathway, and there are different components that have been targeted in history.、Um, there's been cortical、um, stimulation.、Uh, Thalamic stimulation,、um, targeting the caudate nucleus, the putamen, the globus pallidus, or the subthalamic nucleus. And in our talk today, we'll be focusing mostly on electrical stimulation. So back in 1960, Dr. Hassler first stimulated the globus pallidus. In a patient with cervical dystonia, using high frequency, and he found that this suppressed symptoms. Also, Mundinger in 1977 decided to stimulate the areas of the thalamus as well as subthalamic、uh, areas、um, to treat cervical dystonia as well. This continued on into the 1980s,、um, where there were several groups that looked at thalamic stimulation to treat dystonia. And in 1987, Dr. Benabid was credited with heralding in the era of deep brain stimulation when he used stimulation in the thalamus, particularly the VIM nucleus,、um, to treat Parkinson's and essential tremor patients. Okay, next we'll go into deep brain stimulation. So, what is deep brain stimulation? It is an implanted pacemaker-type device for the brain. That it emits a high-frequency, low-voltage、uh, current in a targeted small region of the brain. This stimulation can override abnormal rhythmic brain activity, causing abnormal movements, and allows the restoration of normal movements. And the picture on the right is a diagram of what DBS is. There's an area of stimulation deep in the brain. And then that electrode is connected to a, con a connector electrode, and attaches to a little battery or generator in the chest wall. DBS has been approved for several indications,、um, mostly in the movement disorders.、Um, so not only dystonia, which it was approved in 2003, but earlier、uh, it was also approved for essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. And since then, much research has been done to try to、um, use DBS for other、um, diseases. So the DBS targets can vary, but mostly for movement disorders, they focus on aspects of the basal ganglia. So in essential tremor patients, the VIM part of the thalamus is targeted. The subthalamic nucleus is targeted for patients with Parkinson's disease. As well as 
GPI or Globus pallidus, the internal segment. Also, um, Globus pallidus is used mostly to treat dystonia. And you can also find some studies showing that subthalamic nucleus has been used to treat dystonia as well. To go a little bit more into what the globus pallidus is, it is a nucleus that consists of uh, two segments, the externus and the internus segments. And I think, well, it's a pointer. Okay, great. Just hold in the top. Thank you. So there's two segments, um, the externus and the internus segment, and they're separated by this boundary called the lamina. The GPI can also, this red um, structure here, can also be further subdivided into two regions, the external part of the GPI as well as the internal part of the GPI, and they're also separated by a border or a lamina. Together with the putamen and the caudate, the globus pallidus, and these structures form what we call the striatum. So location is key for deep brain stimulation. And in dystonia patients, we target the globus pallidus internus, or the GPI. And what does it look like? So on MRI scans, you can see um, that it's located here and you can see on an illustration that it's this lighter grayish area here. And that's the target that we're trying to get into um, when we do deep brain stimulation. On these pictures below, you can see an axial view of the brain. And this is a coronal view depicting the globus pallidus. And it, if, you, if you notice this white area down here, that's the optic tract. So the optic tract is directly below the globus pallidus, and that's important whenever we do surgery um, to know exactly where we are in the brain. So there are two different ways to target the globus pallidus. There's indirect targeting and direct targeting. For indirect targeting, um, there's a, a, what we, we use what is called arc-centered stereotaxy. And that uses different coordinates to tell us exactly where in the brain our specific target is. And the way we do that is we pick two points in the brain and we use that to standardize every patient's brain. We use the anterior commissure, which is here, which is a white matter tract, and then we also use the posterior commissure. And there's an imaginary line that's drawn between them and in the middle of that line, or the mid-commissural point, that's called the stereotactic point zero. And this is the point where all other points are referenced to. And as you notice, the GP is not exactly midline. It's more on the side. So we have to reference the location of the GPI in reference to this mid-commissural point. So in direct targeting, it's, it's very nice to have. People back in the 70s didn't have this, um, but we have MRIs that are very capable of showing us uh, very small structures in the brain. And so with direct targeting, you kind of just point and shoot. <laughs> so you can actually pick the area um, directly because you're able to visualize it, and which is very nice. Um, and there's a specific part of the globus pallidus that we target, it's the post postural uh, lateral part of the GPI, and that's typically where we want to put the electrode because that's where it's been found to have the most benefit. So for patients with dystonia, how do you select who undergoes surgery? Uh, typically, patients are referred to a multidisciplinary movement disorder center that involves neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuropsychologists, and psychiatry. Um, and these patients that undergo DBS typically have disabling, medically refractory, primary generalized or segmental torsion dystonia, or adult onset cervical dystonia. They undergo a rigorous uh, barrage of testing um, to see if, deep brain if they would be good candidates for deep brain stimulation. They also obtain imaging um, to make sure that they have normal MRIs. 
um, as well as psychiatric evaluation to make sure there are no other com comorbidities that can preclude them from undergoing this stressful event. Realistic expectations are set uh, for patients and also we ensure that they have a good social support system to go through this uh, surgical process. Okay, next we'll talk a little bit about the procedure. So at my center, we prefer to do um, frame-based uh, GPI DBS, and what that means is we place a, fr a patient in a frame. Before the surgery, every patient gets an MRI of their brain, a very detailed picture of their brain so we know where we want to target. Then on the day of surgery, we apply this frame to their skull, and it's fixated um, through four pins. Then we get a special CT scan or an MRI scan with this frame on because it gives us the markers that we need to fuse to the preoperative MRI in order to target and obtain the coordinates we need for our planned GPI target. Meanwhile, while we're planning, the patient goes back to the operating room and their frame is attached to the operating table. The, um, as you can see, this is during the surgery. The patient is awake. The surgeon's in the back in, in the sterile field. And this neur uh, neurologist is standing here. And he will be um, calming the patient down during the surgery, testing the patient, and helping to um, keep the patient very calm during the surgery. During the surgery, um, once we've obtained the GPI target, we'll drill a burr hole into the skull. This very small uh, hole is about the size of a quarter. And then microelectrodes are um, traveled down into the brain through these cannulas, which are these metal looking rods. And this whole apparatus, this frame, the, um, you can see there, there's this arch right here there's a microelectrode uh, driver that is used to help slowly um, and carefully um, direct the microelectrodes down into the brain tissue. And on the way, we perform microelectrode recording. This is an example of the planning station that we use um, to obtain a target. And you can see here there are different views of the brain. And the green and yellow lines represent the different uh, trajectories that we plan to use to get to our target. And the target is in the GPI here. And when I talked about microelectrode recording, that just means that we put the electrode down to listen to the different neurons as we go down the different tissue. So the pataminal neurons have different firing patterns than the globus pallidus neurons. And even between GPE and GPI, there are different firing patterns. And this helps us tell where exactly in the brain we are. If the firing pattern is more down here, then we know that we're in GPI. Okay, the other um, way to do this surgery is with the patient totally asleep. Um, and that can be done in centers that have intraoperative MRIs. So we use direct targeting in this case. Um, the patient, like I said, is totally asleep. They're under general anesthesia. And these surgeries are performed either in a diagnostic MRI scanner or in a, a surgical suite that has intraoperative MRI. So you can see here, um, there, this is the patient's head, and there are different, um, um, these are different markers that can be used to allow us to place these towers um, into the area to help target exactly where um, our trajectory will be. Then this is the patient in the MRI scanner, and this is showing you the, the two towers. Um, and we have placed a probe targeting the exact area, and in this case, we wanted to target this little purple dot there, and we make sure that the probe is aligned exactly along the trajectory that we had chosen um, preoperatively. And um, it's very nice because you can confirm that you're in the correct trajectory and target intraoperatively. You have real-time guidance to know exactly where you are in the brain.
Unfortunately, you're not able to test the patients because they're asleep, so you don't know if, even if you hit the target um, that you had wanted, that the, tar the, the area, the simulation is going to be as effective in this target, um, which is the nice thing about doing microelectrode recordings. You're able to tell right away if this is going to, to help or if you're having, you're going to have side effects from where you are in the brain. And in dystonia patients, it's a little bit more difficult because um, you don't necessarily see the results right away. Um, for tremor patients or Parkinson's patients, you can actually see a change once the stimulation is turned on. Um, but in dystonia, sometimes it does take a few weeks to months uh, before you get a definite improvement in symptoms. So again, I, I did talk a little bit about the hardware that's located um, in a DBS system, and they're listed here. There's the stimulation probe, the fixation cap, the extension leak, and, and the IPG. And in the US, there are three different companies that um, sell DBS electrodes and equipment. So the complications for this surgery are threefold. There's procedural, hardware, and simulation complications. Dystonia um, specifically can um, ha have this rare complication called status dystonicus, where there's an acute exacerbation of dystonic symptoms, which I've never seen before, but it has been described in the literature, as well as um, some patients who undergo GPI DBS can develop dysarthria, bradykinesia, and freezing of gait afterwards. So what are the mechanisms of DBS for dystonia? Well, no one really knows. Um, we're still doing research for that. Uh, it's suggested that this is a network disorder involving the basoganglia cerebellothalamo cortical circuit with an imbalance in both excitatory and inhibitory transmitters. As uh, you heard Dr. Ando talking about uh, dopamine and GABA, so they're the excitatory and inhibitory uh, transmitters that was mentioned. Um, also, the mechanisms are thought to be multifactorial, uh, require long-term neuronal reorganizations, and involve synaptic plasticity. There is a hypothesis that was recently uh, put out there suggesting that DBS um, actually disrupts or dissociates input and output signals um, and disrupts the abnormal information flow through this cortical basal ganglia motor loop. So what do the results look like? Well, a paper a few years ago looked at different studies looking at the outcomes of different types of DBS for dystonia. On the x-axis, you can see the different groups of dystonia. There's generalized here and, and cranial here, which are the two that we'll focus on. And on the y-axis, you can see that there's the change in dystonia severity. So higher percentage means higher change in severity or, or improvement. And most of the studies have focused on the generalized dystonia or the inherited dystonia because traditionally that's what was found to have the most improvement. And as you can see here, you know, over 50% improvement in most studies showing um, DBS for this type of dystonia. For cranial dystonia or MAGE syndrome, um, there has been some studies out there that suggest that DBS is also very effective, about 60 to 70 percent um, effectiveness in relieving these symptoms. Okay, and um, this was a meta-analysis that was done a couple years ago, and it looked at 523 patients who underwent um, DBS for dystonia um, and found that around 32 months after surgery, there was a 65% improvement um, in their motor symptoms. And so the main outcome of this study was showing that the factors associated with better DBS outcomes were if you were younger at the time of surgery um, and in patients with idiopathic dystonia and you had a greater severity of dystonia at baseline. So the worse uh, symptoms you had, the more room for improvement. Now, specifically for cranial dystonia or MAGE syndrome, uh, which blepharospasm is um, a, a symptom of, um, they looked at um, comparing uh, the different types of DBS, GPI versus STN. There's only 115 patients here, so it is a smaller study. 
Um, but they, they found, interestingly, that there is there was improvement um, in the motor scores as well. So patients did benefit from DBS. And really, the differences between the targets were not significant. So while GPI showed a 57% um, improvement and STN showed a 46%, it was not significantly different. So there's still research out there trying to figure out which is the best target for um, dystonia patients, whether or not it's GPI, STN, um, and the jury's still out on that one. And again, they also show that if you had higher preoperative scores, you would have a larger improvement in your symptoms. Now, the main question for us today is, well, what about just blepharospasm, just isolated blepharospasm? Is DBS effective for that? So there have been three case reports um, that have been uh, done um, most recently. Um, and so it shows, that, yes, you know, blepharospasm can have good improvement with DBS. And all three patients underwent GPI DBS. And this one was a 52-year-old man. Um, at 15 months after surgery, he had a great significant improvement in all of his uh, motor scores, and his quality of life improved. Um, next, there was another patient who underwent other surgical treatments before he underwent GPI DBS. And um, interestingly enough, when I was telling you about location is very important, well, it, sh it showed up in this patient. So he had um, GPI both left and right. The right one was thought to be a little bit more lateral um, than, uh, than intended. And so seven months after he got his surgery, he started noticing that his left blepharospasm started coming back. However, whenever they tweaked the stimulation and tried to immediately direct the stimulation towards GPI, the uh, symptoms improved. So in the end, he developed 63% uh, in improvement in his blepharospasm. And then finally, uh, the last one is a patient who was initially diagnosed with blepharospasm and then developed um, other symptoms and was diagnosed with MAGE syndrome. And he um, had Botox and clonazepam, uh, clonazepam and finally went, underwent uh, DBS. And one year after surgery, he had um, very good outcomes with uh, almost like no more blepharospasm. Okay, and in summary, DBS is an accepted therapy for certain types of medically intractable dystonia, improving the quality of life for some patients. The limited number of patients undergoing bilateral GPI DBS for isolated blepharospasm do receive symptomatic relief. And DBS for MAGE syndrome targeting either GPI or STN is an effective therapy. Patients with worse disease or disability at baseline appear to benefit more from therapy. So future directions, um, we, you know, there is already directions looking at closed loop therapy. Right now, DBS, um, once you turn on the stimulations, always on. But there is research being done to see if um, closed loop stimulation, where you get feedback and you can modify the stimulation um, based on the feedback, um, is being done right now. Also, it would be nice um, to have further studies uh, looking at randomized clinical trials for treatment of blepharospasm, and then comparing DBS uh, for blepharospasm against other surgical options. And it is always important to understand the mechanisms under underlying the effectiveness of deep brain stimulation. Thank you very much.